I now call to order the meeting of the Board of Education for Baltimore County for January 24, 2017. I invite you to rise and recite the Pledge of Allegiance to be led by Johannes Chin, and then invite you to remain standing uh, for a moment of silence and recognition of those who have served education in Baltimore County. I pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. First item on our agenda is to consider the uh, the agenda itself. Um, are there any additions or changes to tonight, tonight's agenda? There are none. All right. Hearing none, is there a motion to adopt the agenda? Mr. Chairman, I have a change. I request Feller. that um, that that two documents be added to the agenda under information that would be accessible to the public through board docs. Uh, should I make them as separate requests so they can be voted on separately? Uh, I don't know what they are, so I guess maybe that's the best idea. The first document is to include uh, the report on the AC status that the board requested in August, and the superintendent is supposed to be furnishing tonight. I assume we'll be getting that as we're adjourning. So it won't be put during the board meeting, so that won't happen. So what's the second one? Okay. Uh, the second document is the written answers to board members questions on the budget. Okay, so just so you know, Mrs. Miller, and so the public knows, those, those documents have already been posted on board docs, so they're available to the public now. Okay, are, are they part of the agenda here or in a, in a separate? The, uh, when we get to the agenda on the um, <coughs> operating budget, uh, I will restate what I just said now, which is that these, those documents uh, the written questions and answers are already posted on board docs. Okay, then then I'll, I'll uh, pull my, my okay. motion. Okay, so is there a motion to accept the uh, agenda? So, so moved. moved. Second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? All right, the agenda stands. Uh, the next item on our agenda is the selection of speakers. Sign-up cards were available to the public prior to the meeting for anyone wishing to speak at the <laughs> meeting. Board practice limits to 10, the number of speakers at regularly scheduled board meetings. Each speaker is allowed three minutes to address the board. The completed sign-up cards for this evening have been placed in the box to my right, and the first 10 <coughs> drawn from the box will be our speakers for tonight uh, during the public comment portion of the meeting. Ms. Brett. Kathy Bloom, Russ Kuhn, Yao Liu, Bosch Farron, Marion Moore, Simon Kwan, Chi Lu Ye. Betty LeBron, Nine. Diana Bergman, Chris Zach. Okay, thank you. Our next item, item E on our agenda, is public comment. Uh, this is one of the opportunities the board provides to hear the views and receive the advice of community members. The members of the board appreciate hearing from interested citizens. As appropriate, we refer your concerns to the superintendent for follow-up. While we encourage public input on policy, programs, and practices within the purview of this board and this system, this is not the proper forum to address specific student or employee matters, nor to comment on matters that do not relate to public education in Baltimore County. We encourage everyone to utilize existing dispute resolution processes. I remind everyone that inappropriate <coughs> personal remarks or other behavior that disrupts or interferes with the conduct of the meeting are out of order. I ask you to observe the three-minute clock, which will let you know when your time is up. Please conclude your remarks when you hear the bell. The microphone will be turned off at the end of your time so that it can um, allow time for other speakers. I now call our advisory groups to speak. 
And our first speaker is TABCO's representative, <coughs> Abby Baton. Ms. Baton. Good evening, Chairman Gillis, Vice Chair Woman Johnson, Dr. Dance, and members of the board. I have continually talked to you about the need for more human resources for our teachers, the need to find more time and supports for teachers so we can do our best for our students. I know all about budgets and limited amounts of funds available. However, I also know all about teaching and what it takes to do what is right for our kids. I'm going to continue with my stories from the trenches. I title this one, Small Expectations Lead to Tremendous Workload for Teachers. This is one teacher's story, but it is repli being replicated in many schools. The teachers were instructed to do this following work in advance of a team meeting. They are given no extra planning time to do this pre-meeting work. The memo said, before you come to our meeting, get familiar with the unit we are planning. Read over it and please know the standards being taught and assessed. Think about what you are currently using for grades, quizzes, projects, classwork, checkpoints, word work, etc. Also, please read this week's teacher tips. I have attached it. At their Monday faculty meeting, they were supposed to have read a chapter from their book study. No time was given for that task either. Tuesday, this teacher had a parent conference before the school day began for teachers. Then on the same evening, there was a school parent student event, which means the day began and ended well before and after the duty day. Report cards went home Thursday along with parent invitations to the awards ceremony, so all students' awards needed to be identified and processed for all four categories. In this same week, teachers were also collecting and counting money for a field trip and a fundraising event for a very worthy charity. This doesn't even take into account the planning for instruction, grading and reporting, nor getting supplies and taking attendance. I think you get the picture. Each task by itself seems small. Teachers are told it's no big deal, it doesn't take much time. Add up all those 10 minutes, half hours, and more, and you have just a small picture of the teacher overload. This doesn't even take into account the hours spent teaching the students without the extra support in class to help these teachers reach all of their students on a regular basis. Between the grading and reporting rollout and the constant changing expectations and glitches, we can't begin to complete all the work required. The sad fact is that much of the extra time is spent working on non-teaching duties. Hall duty, cafeteria duty, bus duty, lunch duty, to name just a few, add to this never-ending time drain. Teachers in high schools are constantly giving up time they could be, that could be spent planning. Instead, they are covering classes. Teachers can't be spending all the time they need to work with students when they are spending so much of their own time on non-instructional work. This cannot continue if we want to keep great teachers in our classrooms. Teachers cannot be asked to give up our entire lives to teaching. This is not sustainable. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Baden. Our next speaker is the PTA Council of Baltimore County's representative, Leslie Weber. Ms. Weber. Good evening. I'm Leslie Weber, PTA Council Communications Chair, speaking tonight on behalf of Emory Young, our President. At the last Board of Education meeting, PTA Council expressed grave concerns about BCPS's new grading policy and requested that BCPS create a survey for students and families to submit feedback on how the policy was, was affecting them. Another survey goal would be to determine if the policy addendum had improved the situation during the second quarter. We very much appreciate that Board of Ed member Marisol Johnson took note of stakeholder requests made at the January 10th meeting and raised these issues at the most recent curriculum committee meeting. At that meeting, in response to the request for a grading policy survey, it was stated that such a survey would not be created because BCPS was relying on feedback from the grading and reporting steering committee. Unfortunately, PTA Council was not invited to be a part of this committee, despite the fact that both policy and Rule 1210 recognize that PTA Council and local PTA units are important partners to ensure academic success for all students and to improve schools. A significant problem is that steering committee meetings are held during the day when it's very difficult for working parents to attend. This could mean that BCPS is not getting the input it needs, input from the people the policy directly affects. If BCPS truly values parental input, they would have a representative from the PTA Council on the committee and would not hold meetings at a time that precludes parents from attending. 
PTA Council respectfully requests a seat at the table on all such committees since we're the largest and oldest advocate for parents. So again, PTA Council requests that a survey be created for students and parents to offer feedback on how the grading policy is affecting them. The, stu the survey must also ask if the addendum has provided needed clarification for students, parents, and teachers on how grades are calculated and if grading policies are now more consistent, equitable, and accurate. BCPS has stated goals for revising the policy. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Weber. Our next speaker is the representative from the ESPBC, and that's uh, Lila Marinbloom. Good evening. I'm Lila Marinbloom, the President of the Educational Support Professionals of Baltimore County. I represent the 2,000 paraeducators, office professionals, health assistants, interpreters, and technicians who are contained in our ESPBC bargaining unit. Our paraeducators offer individualized <coughs> or small group academic support. Our interpreters communicate in sign language to our hearing disabled students so that they can understand their lessons and, uh, co uh, and work in the classroom. Our health assistants support students to ensure that they are healthy when at school. Our office professionals are the gatekeepers of information. I enjoy looking at the Team BCPS logo. Unfortunately, as part of a team, we support staff are left out of key pieces of information. How would it look if Matt Ryan, Falcons quarterback, created a play and did not inform his team? It probably would not be very successful. Similarly, BCPS gives key pieces of information during faculty meetings. While there is currently allowances for support staff to receive comp time for attending such meetings with administrative approval, they are not regularly approved, resulting in support staff being left out of the information cycle. We need to be a forethought. We need to have the opportunity to be at the faculty meetings and to be compensated for attending them. Funding is needed so that we can discuss its implementation in future negotiations. As a support and integral part of Team BCPS, the support staff need access to timely and relevant information. In addition to faculty meetings, this is conveyed through emails. Not all our paraeducators have consistent and reliable access to technology because not of all of our paraeducators in BCPS have been issued devices. Paraeducators are also the individuals who reinforce skills taught by the classroom teacher. We need the devices and ongoing training in order to ensure that all paras are knowledgeable and equipped to support students. I would like to take this opportunity for uh, to thank you for including the support staff in the BCPS professional study days between February, January, th between Friday, January 13th and Tuesday, January 17th. Over 300 of our support staff received meaningful and relevant professional development. This event made us feel a valuable part of BCPS. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Marinbloom. Our next speaker is from the Citizens Advisory Committee for Gifted, Talented Education, and that's Julie miller breitz Good evening, Chairman Gillis, board members, Dr. Dance, and the BCPS community. Happy New Year to everyone. 
At our last meeting in 2016, we were happy to host Dr. Dance and share with him the advisory stances that our group has been working on over the last year and that I have distributed to you tonight. These recommendations are aligned with Blue Point 2.0, reflect the stakeholder input we have been collecting since last spring, and many hours of work among our committee. We were gratified to see Mr. Virch and Ms. Causey at our meeting and for so many of the BCPS team, Ms. White, Ms. Byers, Mr. Kearns, to be in attendance. We very much appreciate your support and time. Our recommendations are in four broad areas. I will summarize some of our thinking in a moment, but I encourage all of you to take some time and read through our work. I would welcome any follow-up questions or conversations that our three minutes here tonight won't allow for. Our first area of concern is in training and identification. We find that there are process problems, a lack of information or contradictory information about GT programs provided to parents, teacher training problems, and a non-identification of minority populations so that many GT classes do not reflect the diversity of the school that the student attends. Our recommendations include funding a new staff position in the AA office, paying GT facilitators, incentivizing teachers to become nationally board certified in exceptional studies, implementation of the full battery COGAT test and re-implementation of the Catalyst program. Our second area of concern is in the delivery of elementary GT instruction. We hear that many children are bored, twice exceptional children are not being accommodated, too many skill levels in the classroom make it very difficult for GT students to get face-to-face -face teacher time, and that there is insufficient in accountability for the delivery of excellent GT instruction. Remedies include creating a fourth strand above the current accelerated strand, having a more robust system in place to identify students who would benefit from subject or grade level acceleration by using the Iowa Acceleration Scale Tool, identifying 2E learners via the use of structured observation protocols, making use of cluster and flexible ability grouping, and increasing principal oversight of GT instruction. We also looked at how BCPS could better develop a flexible system-wide GT program. Beginning with the earliest learners, we recommend that pre-K opportunities be available in BCPS schools, that restrictions on early entry to kindergarten be relaxed, and that BCPS consider opening or developing public Montessori schools. We also recommend that educational enrichment opportunities be developed for during the school day, after school, as well as over the summer. We also strongly believe that partnerships with four-year colleges and universities need to be developed so that highly gifted students who have exhausted the offerings at their school have access to challenging courses. Finally, there continues to be issues around communication. We recommend developing more effective pipelines to get GT-related information more widely circulated both on a system-wide basis and on a school-to-parent basis. Child-specific communication should also be improved. Our next meeting will be on February 1st at Windsor Mill Middle School. Thank you very much. Our uh, first public speaker is Kathy Bloom. Good evening. Good evening. Um, thank you for having me here. I'm from the Lansdowne community, Lansdowne High School more specifically, and um, my question is, I have was not able to attend the meeting in December, right before Christmas, and I understand that there's some concerns that could possibly derail the renovation that's scheduled for Lansdowne High School, that we were waiting for some surveys or some reports. Um, do you know anything about that? I think Ms. Causey, I spoke to her and she said possibly they had just arrived. Um, but I just wanted to make sure that there wasn't anything that was going to derail the renovation. No? At this point, I just want to make sure that we're on record for that because that's not what I came to understand. But we're... Ms. Bloom... They're no, not, we're it, not waiting for any reports. Right. M m oh, go ahead. This meeting, which should be documented on video too, okay, you can I, look through I was, as well, regarding well, the results here? of a. No, I understand okay. entirely. That's hopefully why we record it <laughs> and, too. Okay. And Ms. Bloom, if I may interrupt, uh, Mr. Dixit is seated in the first row right there, and he can talk to you, uh, um, kind of when okay. your talk time is up. Okay, but everything is still going as scheduled, and we've received the reports that we needed. So, okay. Okay. All right. I just want to make sure because I was concerned that there would be some items that might possibly derail the renovation, and that concerned me. Very good. But we're good. All right. Thank you, Thank you very much. 
Thank you. Our next speaker is Russ Kuhn. Mr. Kuhn, I got it right this time. Take some practice. All right, well, thank you for having me today. Um, I'm gonna get right to it because I'm limited on time. I, I came here tonight to talk about uh, the overall budget. Um, I know this is a, is a very large document. I appreciate the copy. Um, and that it's a lot to go through for everybody. Um, I just wanna highlight a few, a few questions that I have. Um, and hopefully, you know, if, if you don't discuss it now, you'll discuss it later when you're going back and forth. Um, under expenditure summary, on page 71, there's um, a line item called other instructional costs that has, has gone from $12 million in FY14 to over $56 million proposed for FY18. Other is kind of a broad category. Um, I'm not exactly sure what that is. Hopefully it can be addressed and, and, and folks can discuss it. Um, also, and I, I'm guessing this is, um, it may be related, but on page 80, the contracted services under other instructional costs goes from 10 million to 53 million over the same time period. Maybe they're related somehow, I don't know. It's very difficult to kind of figure that out. Maybe it's in the detail in the document, I don't know. Um, uh, my next question or actually concern is really about the STAT program and focusing on the hardware, the one-to-one -one device um, leases that are four years that tie us to four years per device. They seem um, exceedingly high and over time that, that cost is gonna just continue and it's gonna grow based on uh, the number of, of um, devices and people within uh, Baltimore County. Uh, so I'm concerned and I'm hopeful that perhaps you'll open it back up for review to find uh, a cheaper alternative. Uh, I know that there's uh, something that just came out today about Chromebooks on Fast Company, talking about brand new Chromebooks that have um, uh, you know, significant uh, educational value and that were focused for the educational market uh, and that they had made a number of um, enhancements uh, yeah. so that uh, it, they worked a lot better. But I know that those devices are expensive and um, they should be driven down over time. So I'm, I'm definitely concerned about that $50 million expenditure that's gonna be ongoing year after year, along with um, the investment that we're making in, in, in STAT. I look forward to the, um, the release, I hope at some point in time, of the mid-year report from Johns Hopkins about the academic process on the STAT program uh, so that we actually can see what the results are academically. Thank you, Mr. Kuhn. Our next speaker is Hua Lu. Hi, good evening, BOE members. Thank you for having me here. So I come here today just went to the BCPS have some can uh, can do something for our Chinese New Year. So I have uh, two kids in Baltimore County Public School. One is uh, Dulani High, another is uh, Pinewood Elementary School. So I am also the board member of the Baltimore Chinese School. And uh, I was one of the person in charge of the Chinese New Year's big celebration on last Saturday night at the Dulani Heights. I, I thank you some BOE members come to our celebrations. So on the, the, that celebrations, we have 263 performers and uh, over 800 audience come to these celebrations. And most of the kids and the family and the parents come from the BCPS systems. So, uh, this celebration is very successful and for, for, for 
um, unforgettables. Uh, our community and all kids, uh, uh, in order to prepare this uh, uh, celebration, we almost prepared for one whole year. So we are willing to do that because we are so, we want to our kids in Baltimore, uh, our kids know their cultures, and they have a good memory for their cultures, so when they grow up. So, um, this weekend uh, is our Chinese New Year days. So, so this day, so I just like this one. So we have a lot of things to do in Chinese New Year. So almost we celebrate 15 days. So, but my, uh, we have lots of things to do in Chinese New Year's and the ceremonies. So like they visit relatives and prepare the nice food, dress up and decoration home, and they distribute the red bag for the young kids and uh, give some nice gift for, for senior people. Um, I wish my son and my daughter can stay at home with me to celebrate but they have to go to school. So it's very, for me, it's feel very sorry about that. I think they, uh, so, uh, so I come to this uh, country with a dream. So I, I think uh, uh, we achieved a lot of things, but I still have a little under the beautiful dreams. I wish one day Baltimore County Public School can, can consider our Chinese Asian. Can, can celebrate our holidays. Um, I think in close uh, Ellicott City, um, Harvard County already celebrate uh, this uh, Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Bosch Ferron. Good evening to all. Good evening. Today I'm reading. One board member deserves my best compliment, appreciation, and encouragement for all the year 2016. The said board member has been most active in preparation and discussion, positive in approach of issues, always eager to reach out to those who do not share the same thoughts. Always came well prepared and informative, caring about all students, especially those who do not have political support, and always most professional and polite in her debate, tenacious on issues that touches the hearts of all students. To me, that Ms. Kathleen Cozy has been a powerful voice for the air conditional issues, for the renovation, the rebuilding of dilapidated school systems, and not only in your area, but also in faraway areas such as Lansdowne. Ms. Cozy has worked really so hard to have a fairer grading system, and really let us not forget Ms. Cozy voted for the Muslim holidays when so many people were eager to scapegoat a large population and a big religion. So for that, Ms. Cozy, I am honestly most honored to have watched you since the day one you came in. You are truly an asset for all Baltimore County. You brought life to the Board of Education for no personal gain. You are the most honorable, appreciated, and effective board member in my heart and my mind for the year 2016. The truth you bring to the Board of Education shall save us all. We are all indebted to you. I really encourage all board members to take notice of what I said. I have no interest or personal interest, and I really feel that I should appreciate everyone for what they do. Nonetheless, Ms. Cozy really, truly makes me say all these words, 
and she has not paid me anything. There is nothing really personal. This is my honest opinion. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Marion Moore. Good evening, education leaders. For the past four years, I've watched this budget process from the sidelines, wanting to assist with, the changing, with changing the economics of this education game. But a point guard can't assist if his teammate eagerly dribbles the basketball in order to score. Sometimes in sports, some players strive to score points seeking personal power or seeking acceptance from the fans or sponsors. So what are you seeking as leaders? What is the true game plan behind your annual budget? Can we all win and score with equity as we plan for and create our economic future through the education system? Now, from a business standpoint, we all know that whoever has the biggest financial stake in a business has the most power over decision making. So if the county government has the biggest stake, of course, it, it impacts the order in which schools are built, renovated, air conditioned, or whose business contract wins a bid from the school system. Therefore, it would be fair to say favoritism, nepotism, racism, and classism may play a role in the budget process. In 2012, I began formulating an economic plan that would bring balance to your financial decisions with reducing how much money you request from your local and state government so more funds can be used by the government to create jobs that your globally competitive students will need upon graduation. I believe through your education foundation, you can generate more revenue for your programs, and through STAT, you can create more career and entrepreneurial opportunities for your students and staff, reducing your payroll costs, yet generating tax revenue for your local economy or tax benefits to those who invest in the future of BCPS. More importantly, giving your teachers or staff ownership over their learning experiences instead of approving multi-million contracts with private companies that could be done prudently with your own employees will, of course, increase retention and raise the morale of your school system. Notably, in the next five years, more budget cuts will be impacting your, your spending. So now is the time for more innovative financial plans. Lastly, Dr. Dance, if you're leading team BCS, BCPS in a marathon and you want them to get to the finish line, are you leading from the front where the public can clearly see you and provide you with winning accolades while some of your team are struggling? to keep up with your ambitious goals? Or are you going to leave from behind so that you can actually see how each department are managing their time, pacing themselves during this global competition? Maybe you're sometimes running beside your teammates so that you can actually hear and see them clearly when they're having uh, issues with workload or running at your speed, not to mention being pushed out of the way or bullied by their competitive colleagues. I'm sure you may have explored a variety of these strategies, but I'm about to get cut off. Thank you. Our next speaker is Simon Quion. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening, dear Honorable BOE members and dear Dr. Dance. My name is Simon Chan and I am in fifth grade. I go to Riderwood Elementary School. It is a very nice school and I enjoy going there. Overall, I like my school. There's only one thing I don't like though, how we Asian American kids don't have our own holidays to be celebrated. It is not because I want a day off from school, but because I want to be proud of our culture and heritage is. Our culture is very important to us and it makes us who we are. Culture is what holds us together as one people. It holds us together like glue. Culture identity is like how people eat and drink. It is a necessity of life. My mom always teaches me about Chinese cultures and I know Lunar New Year is the most important holiday for Asian Americans. Actually, we just had our 2017 Lunar New Year celebration in our community last Saturday. One thing striking me at the celebration party is that a lot of non-Chinese speaking friends also came to our party and celebrated with us. I think it is not time now that Lunar New Year is celebrated 
in the public school system, like holidays for other races, so that we can bring cultural awareness to Baltimore County and be proud of our culture identity. It will also show that Baltimore County is a true, equal, and inclusive place to embrace culture, diversity, and new ideas. Thank you very much for considering my quest. Happy New Year. Thank you, Simon. Our next speaker is Shuli Jha. Good evening. Good evening. Dear BUE members and uh, dear Dr. Dance, first of all, I'd like to thank all, uh, I'd, I'd like to thank uh, school board members to, uh, for spending last Saturday night with us to celebrate 2017 Nora New Year. This celebration gala was put together by hundreds of people working together, include a lot of uh, non-Chinese speaking for performance. This truly encouraged us to do more to contribute to our society. In the last three decades, the demography of Baltimore County has changed dramatically, with 7% Asian Americans living in the county. It's time to equally address the culture and identity needs of Asian American students, because it will not only make them be proud of their own heritage, it will also pass the wisdom of their ancestors to their kids, so that when they grow up, they can use thoughts and ideas from another culture background to contribute to, to our society. Old policy to recognize cultural identity needs and close school only for a race with big population contradicts with the idea of inclusion, fairness, and equality. We can no longer ignore the cultural identity needs of a race even with a very small population. Otherwise, it would act like majority over a worse over minority. This is not how democracy should work. This is a difficult time for our nation. Last Friday, the, pre the presidential inauguration ceremony took place in DC. The very next day, hundreds of thousands of people went to DC to protest and ask for a more inclusive society. To me, inclusion should start from the neighbors. It's action that should, should start from the people's own friends. It's time to bring unity to our society so that we include everyone and stay as a nation without division. Even with the new school opening policy, there are still many ways to create a true inclusive and equal BCPS, either by creating an international day or by giving floating holiday account to non-Christian students so they can choose one day to stay at home to celebrate their, their tra traditions um, with, uh, while the school stay open for others. I'm happy to work with school board and other community leaders to find a way to, come to, accommodate, to accommodate the culture identity needs for all races. Working together and bring unity to a society. This is our culture. This is a culture of Chinese people with 5,000 years of history. This is a culture we brought with us to contribute to this country. And this is a culture we want acceptance. Thank you very much and Happy New Year. Thank you. Our next speaker is Betty Lebrun. Good evening, panel. Good evening. I hope I can read my scribblings. <laughs> I'm Betty LeBron, lifelong Marylander, born and raised in Rosedale, graduated Kenwood High. Uh, my two sons went through the Baltimore County Public Schools and later my grandson also. I have been a vocal music teacher, some part-time, some full-time in Howard County, retired in the 90s, and did, then did extensive sub-teaching at Liberty Christian in Randallstown and St. Paul's Lower School in Brooklynville. So I have extensive uh, experience with the public school system. Um, you're talking about the budget. Um, a fellow worker at my part-time job at Perry Hall in a restaurant is very concerned about the overcrowding situation, both at Perry Hall Middle and the also the high school. Maybe you're already working on this. This is my first time here. But I would like to urge you to put this at your top, the top of the list, uh, whether it be portable uh, portables that they used up the road for me uh, at uh, Owings Mills um, High, or a nice extension built on it the way they did at Franklin. But something needs to be done, and please do it soon. Don't study it for two years. I mean, get, get it, somebody studying it. And also, sometimes consultant fees are ridiculously high. Look carefully and shop around for a consultant that will charge uh, a decent fee. Uh, and again, I'm going to stress our tax money. The Perry Hall parents, it's a great area. The parents are very hardworking. It's a very low crime. 
crime area, they deserve the best for their students. So please get on this overcrowding situation ASAP for Perry Hall Middle and Perry Hall High. Second issue, I've noticed in education, uh, it tends to be top heavy toward administration. Um, our administrators uh, in general are very well paid. Um, I would like to see even uh, a freeze on any kind of raises that administrators might be getting. I don't know if that's within your jurisdiction, but put a freeze on it. They, it, they won't suffer too much, I don't think. Uh, put a freeze on it and see if some uh, administrative jobs could be uh, combined or um, uh, uh, cut back and whatever. I heard of one school, now this might be Harford County, I have friends in Harford County also, uh, that uh, they had one vice principal just to handle the school buses. Is that a full-time job? Another one had a principal and four vice principals. Do they really need four? So look at this and see what you can do about the top, the top heavy costs, uh, uh, because the cost should go into the education of the children and for the teachers. And real quickly, air conditioners, uh, air conditioners in windows work just fine. Please get on this and get window air conditioners in every school. Uh, and remember, at the bottom line is the best for the children. And uh, having been a teacher many, many years. That's what I'm Thank you. Our next speaker is Diana Bergman. Good evening, everybody. Man. It's been overwhelming my community with the elections and what I've seen observing. So I'm just gonna get to the point. I wanna speak from the heart. Um, I'm from Lansdowne. I have my oldest in Lansdowne Middle School and my youngest at Baltimore Highlands. Um, I really appreciate you guys coming and visiting our school recently. Dr. Dance was there and so was Nick. So you got to see how we are. Culturally, our school culture and our community needs to change. We look very diverse, but the inclusion piece is not there. And what I'm asking for today is additional behavior health service support for my community. I don't see our young children learning strong social skills as they develop and they go into middle school, it becomes more challenging, and they go into high school and it becomes more challenging. It starts at the bottom when these kids come in to learn how to get along and work well together. And they can't do it if they don't have the tools. So as my community starts being as diverse as they are, and they move forward for that transition to be exclusive, because that's what's gonna make us great. We need those additional resources and tools. We need the behavior specialists, the analysts. We need you know additional counselors, social workers, I mean, yeah, I get it. We also need the school buildings, you know? These kids have to be motivated coming in and we need an update. But we also need an update to make sure these kids could learn how to communicate, work well with each other, and move forward to make progress. Move forward to make progress so as they become our future, our next president could come from Lansdowne, why not? You know, our next superintendent could come from Baltimore Highlands, why not? Our next principal that top blue ribbon school could come from Riverview, why not? So from all the things, I mean, I also want to thank also Mr. Mayo over the winter break. Um, I reached out to Fort Meade. We have great leaders there. Our soldiers, they transition out. We have spouses. They understand structure, discipline, and leadership skills. Okay, and inviting them to provide that support from our community since we have a shorthanded of substitute teachers and educators. I reached out, made that connection. I really appreciate he was open, had a great discussion. I introduced him to two people that can really support our area. And I know it's gonna cost fundings, but please look into this. You guys are looking at your budget, pour it into. These kids deserve it. They all deserve it, no matter how hard their life is. Okay, so thank you for this opportunity. I really appreciate it. And thank you for coming and visiting my community and getting to see what it's like. Thank you. Our final speaker is Chris Zach. Uh. 
Members of the board, whoops, my screen went blank. There it is. Members of the board, good evening. Um, as treasurer of the Lansdowne High School PTSA, I bring you once again warm and fraternal greetings from the staff, from the students, and of course from the parents of Lansdowne High School. Um, I have two items to bring to your attention. First one was regarding the status of the renovation, but as my compatriot, Mrs. Bloom, has already addressed that, I'll just uh, pull a Jimmy Malone and say, me too, so we can leave that. Second up, um, I'd like to bring an issue of concern to you that uh, just recently happened. Last Friday, there was a rather significant security incident over at Lansdowne High School, um, the details of which can be seen on many of the major news sites uh, that I heard over the weekend. We are concerned about this, to say the least, and as an information security professional, I know that a root cause analysis will be done to identify what happened, where the failure was in security, and what can be done to improve it. Um, we would very much welcome involvement in exactly what happened and how it can be addressed. I know Lansdowne was built 50 years ago. It's an earlier time. They had different issues. The construction of that time didn't take into account the threats, opportunities, and issues that we're currently facing today. Um, thus, if this event turned out to be due to the large number of exits, limited control around the egress, ex e egress of those exits, and or blind spots in the school's cameras or uh, camera system, I would like that to be noted as yet another reason to consider either A, an upgrade, or B, a retrofit of the school so that, like the new Relay Elementary School, which is being built in my backyard, is built to be safe, secure, to the latest codes and standards for the best education of our students and, of course, my children. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next on our agenda is item F, and I invite Dr. Mayo to present personnel matters. Good evening, Chairman Gillis, Vice Chairwoman Johnson, Dr. Dance, members of the board. I'd like board consent for the following personnel matters, retirements and resignations. I have a motion to approve the personnel matters F1 and F2. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you, Dr. Mayo. Thank you. Next on our agenda are contract awards, and for that I call our committee chair, Mr. McDaniels. Thank you, Mr. Gillis. Um, members of the board, the board's building and contracts committee met earlier this evening. Items G1 through G3 are being forwarded to the full board for approval. Do I have a motion to approve items G1 through G3? So moved. Uh, no second is needed since the recommendation comes from the committee. Any discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Uh, the contracts passed. Thank you. Next on our agenda is item H, and that is uh, report on policies, first readings, and for that I call on our committee chair, Ms. Williams. Good evening, Mr. Chair, Madam Vice Chair, members of the board. The Board of Education's Policy Review Committee has reviewed the policies presented to you for first read on tonight's board agenda as Exhibit H. Uh, the committee is recommending the policies 5140 and 5150 be moved forward for second reader. Thank you. Do I have a motion to adopt the recommendation, the recommendation of the Policy Review Committee? So moved. Uh, no second is required again since it comes from a committee. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Very good. Thank you, Ms. Williams. The uh, first reader passes to second reader. Uh, next on our agenda is item I. And I invite Mr. Saris and Mr. Tantleff to come to the table. I think maybe Mr. Smith as well um, uh, to discuss the um, FY 2018 operating budget. Chair, members of the board, Dr. Dance, 
um, I'm going to get out of the way and let these gentlemen who've done the lion's share of this work here um, proceed. Um, George Saracen, I'm joined by George Saracen with Tanliff, um, who will go through the questions and the information that we have for you today. And I'll turn it over to George. Good evening, uh, Chair and members of the board. Uh, I just wanted to open uh, with an introductory statement that follows from uh, the uh, board comments portion of our last meeting on January 10th. Uh, at the close of that meeting, allegations were made that BCPS staff has not followed board policy and rules. And I wish to state as emphatically as I can that that is not accurate. Uh, in the materials pres presented to the board uh, this afternoon and made public this evening, uh, there are questions that uh, relate to this topic, and they've been fully answered. Uh, I remind everyone that on February 2nd, 2016, the board decided not to lease projectors, to rebid the project without sand man sound management for a period of one year. The board did not direct staff to remove the thousands of projectors in our classrooms, nor did they ask us or direct us not to include the latest technology in our newly constructed and renovated schools, nor did they direct us to cease replacing the or repairing the existing projectors. Projectors of one form or another have been in our classrooms since at least 1965 when I was in third grade. And I marveled at the magic of an overhead projector with a piece of plastic sheet and a crayon. The board uh, directed us to revise the RFP and we are currently evaluating technology alternatives and we are not yet ready to bring that proposal back to this board. In the operating budget before us and in the multi-year stat plan in the work session document, there are no funds designated for systemic pre projector installations. The capital budget does include funds for furniture, fixtures, equipment, and startup costs, which may well include projectors, but they will, as all projectors have been, purchased under existing valid board approved contracts. And so with that, I would like uh, our budget director, Whit Tantliff, to uh, introduce you to the work session document that we have, and then we will take additional questions. Thanks. Thanks. I'm just going to um, give a brief overview of the work session document that you all have in front of you. I'll hit uh, some of the highlights and make it brief, and then, uh, of course, we'll be glad to take any questions you may have. Um, page one shows a roll-up of the various revenues that make up the $1.68 billion operating budget and our $2 billion overall budget. General funds are our most flexible revenues and pays for most of our operating expenses and is mainly funded by the state and county, while special funds refer to grants. The capital projects funds covers our capital needs and has already been voted on by the board. The debt service funds required for state reporting purposes to account for the payment of interest and principal on long-term obligation debt. Debt results from the sale of bonds for construction and renovation through the capital budget. The board has no contingent liability for the repayment of long-term debt incurred by the state and county to finance the construction of public schools in the county. And finally, the enterprise fund covers all financial activities of the food service uh, program and also the internal service fund co uh, covers our self-insured workers comp claims. <coughs> the bottom of page one shows uh, BCPS's projected 2018 enrollment which is projected to increase by 1,102 or 1% 1 to uh, 113,241. Uh, page two, uh, maintenance of effort ref refers to the state law dictating the mandatory county portion of BCPS funding and once it's set the per pupil amount um, has to be at least that amount in the following year. With permission from MSD one-time expenses can be excluded and depending on the financial position of the county and needs of the schools 
You can see that some years the county supplied above maintenance of effort, and some years, particularly during the recession, the county funded right at maintenance of effort. In FY9 and 10, the county stepped in to help offset a state funding crisis. Um, and this year, BCPS is requesting 6.6% or 49.7 million above maintenance of effort. The revenue mix uh, varies by counties throughout Maryland due to uh, the funding formula called Thornton based on many factors. In Baltimore, we derive 54.7% of our general fund funding from the county, 43.1% from the state, 2.2% from other sources including tuition interests, our local portion of our county living arrangements um, for other Maryland jurisdictions with kids at BCPS. Um, and finally, on page three, the pie chart throws a general fund split up in the way that MSD requires us to report expenses to them. Salaries and benefits, um, as you've heard several times, make up 83% of the overall operating budget. Pages four through 12 lists all requests that we're making to the board separate into the three budget principles of managing growth, raising the bar and closing gaps, and investing in our future, in the future, plus a detailed uh, updated stat financial chart. Um, that's a brief summary of the uh, budget and the document you have in front of you, and um, at this point we'll be glad to address any questions or concerns you may have. Thank you, Mr. Tantliff. Uh, board members were asked to submit questions to the staff in advance of the meeting, and answers to those questions were given to board members this afternoon. Hard cap copies were placed at your seat. Mrs. Miller, I misspoke when I said it's on board docs. It's actually on the board, on the school system's website uh, in the budget section, The um, uh, those questions and answers. Uh, so um, there's no real need to uh, restate for uh, the persons before us tonight the questions that we've already had written uh, answers to. But it's now our time uh, to uh, to ask questions of the persons who are presenting the budget, operating budget to us, and I in invite board members to ask questions. Mrs. Miller. Yes, thank you. Um, my overall concerns with the budget are very similar to what they were last year. Um, and they surround around priority issues, uh, top-heavy administration, unsustained, possibly unsustainable and unproven digital conversion program, or otherwise known as the STAT program, and making sure that we get the best use of our funding dollars. So um, my first comment and question um, the recently updated uh, BCPS digital conversion plan projects a um, $257 million cost by FY18 and annual costs of $57 million going forward. So my, my question for Kevin Smith, uh, in your professional opinion, is the STAT program financial, financially sustainable in the long run? or are we setting our school system up for a financial disaster down the road that different leadership will have to address? Yes, the STAT program is sustainable in the current budget that we have now. Thank you. Um, an another question is about um, Central AC. Considering that the number of the, um, the remaining 34 schools that still need AC, mm -hmm. um, uh, some of them need to be completely rebuilt. Um, and AC is a third of the cost of a new school. Will the installation of central AC in schools that have outlived their life expectancy cause a delay in replacing those schools? I'm concerned about putting AC, central AC in schools that have already outlived their life expectancy. The capital plan that we have um, is an incorporation of AC, growth, and replacement uh, and additions of aging facilities. So there was a thorough review of all of those various buildings, and that's how the capital plan on an annual basis is derived. So I think I'm answering your question. Um, the schools that currently have central air will be monitored every year like we do any of our buildings, but the schools that are remaining are being addressed based on the need 
and the uh, functionality of that particular building. If it makes more sense to replace the building or put an addition, that's how we will approach the AC. Um, but there is a list that's already been, Correct. you know, they're already slated. So, and some of those have outlived their life expectancy. Some of those buildings are quite old. And, and so they're part of the, re the, the future capital plans for either replacements, renovations, additions, or, um, or, or new schools or new replacement schools. So if they receive the central AC, will that delay those renovations, additions? In most cases, it's going to be incorporated in that process, or it's going to be a, a that or that is the only process that's happening for that particular school, correct? Very good, thank you. Um, last year, I raised the issue of our system being top heavy in the central office and our administration. And in the budget book on page 18, it appears that we're going dramatically in the wrong direction in correcting that. Uh, last year, the admin costs increased by about 14%. And this year, it's being proposed about 18% increase in admin. At the same time, instructional salaries and wages is increasing only 3.6%. So I'm concerned about the opportunity cost in instructional salaries and wages, um, given this 18% admin increase. Uh, as opposed to the idea of holding the increase in admin, at the same level as we hold the increase in instructional salaries and wages. Um, so can you explain first why is this category continuing to increase so dramatically? And um, does this figure uh, include the non-instructional, does the instructional salaries figure include non-instructional stat teachers and, and consulting teachers? Yeah, I'm going to have uh, Mr. Tantliff answer the initial part of that question. Um, sure. So, well, actually, first on the um, uh, the teacher uh, piece of it, stat teachers and consulting teachers are an instructional um, with salaries and wages according to the MSDE definition. Um, MSD further clarifies by providing the following um, position types for instructional teachers and instructor, instructors, teaching assistants, teaching aides, teaching trainers, teaching interns, tutors, specialists, librarians, guidance counselors, school psychologists, coaches, um, technical staff, and substitute teachers. So they are, uh, according to the MSD definition, all the stat teachers should be in instructional. Even though they're non-instructional? So they, they meet the definition of instruction. Same psychologist, there's other things that may not be the person standing in front of the classroom, but they're still supporting the children in the classroom. Um, do you have a breakdown between teachers that are actually directly instructing students as opposed to what I would call non-instructional? Like um, how much of that? Well, we can tell you what the position type is of uh, everyone in the system. And the budget book does a pretty good uh, job of that. Some um, we would uh, maybe need to do a bit of research on. Maybe you can um, point me to a, to a page on can, that. If you look on page yeah. 122, you'll see that there are approximately 5,100 classroom teachers and another 2,000 types of other instructional staff. Okay, thank you. And then the other part of my question was, why is the admin category increasing so dramatically? Um, sure. Uh, so I think part of it you asked between um, the two years. So first last year, um, and remember a lot of the one time, there's a lot of one times that are um, technology related in the budget. So last year, I mean, the initial budget, um, I think when you brought this up, the Advantage Financial System, which is our, our main enterprise system, was 3.2 million. There was fiber optic cabling. Um, the enterprise backup system was 400,000, and it, um, large server capacities uh, were 348,000. That was the majority of the Activity One or administrative increases last year. N a number of those things ended up getting um, removed from the final budget, in particular the Advantage system, which we're requesting again uh, this year. And so 
that's driving uh, a chunk of the increase. But uh, for this year in particular, um, we have 1.3 million for software license fees. We have 3.4 million again for the upgrade of our enterprise system and uh, for uh, going to the next upgrade of our of our swipe system, Kronos. Um, we have 1.2 million for IT servers. Um, uh, and then there's about 3 million that covers uh, steps and colas and also an, um, a part of the uh, superintendent's reorganization was FT neutral, but it moved some positions into administration. Right, and a number of those positions, um, by my own error, really should be in mid-level administration um, because the uh, executive directors and the directors for school performance are all based in schools. They meet the MSDE definition of mid-level school-based administrators. So the next edition of this book uh, will correct for that classification error. This edition being? Uh, we'll have before the end of February. Okay. <laughs> Okay. Ms. Miller, if I may uh, interrupt, uh, it's been about 10 minutes and we have a lot of other uh, people, so if I may just stop you there and ask if there's others on the board who have questions at this moment. If we still have time and you still have more questions, we can surely uh, return to you. Mrs. Eaton. Thank you. On page 80 of the budget book under other instructional costs, it says other charges. What would be some examples of other charges? Yeah, you have a list of those. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> okay. A lot of those are employee uh, benefits. Um, yeah, here's a health insurance uh, is the biggest chunk overall in the system under other Social Security, um, our pension plan, private placement tuition, non-public, uh, otherwise known as state retirement, gas and electric, workers' comp insurance, dental insurance, telephone services. And that comes under instructional costs? Other charges. Okay. And they're in every activity. Okay. Okay, thank you. So they're spread amongst yeah, the, the biggest system. chunk. If you look on the very last page of the budget, two, 328, you'll see the the $321 million uh, employee benefit piece, which represents the largest portion of yeah. that $405 million uh, other charge question you had on page 81. Okay, thank you. I have a fast question. Mr. Just, some, just some clarification. Uh, Ms. Miller said that, I believe I heard her say that, that one third of the cost of constructing a school is air conditioning. Is that correct? Say that again. I, I think I heard Mrs. Miller earlier say that one third the cost of constructing a school is air conditioning. I find that kind of hard to believe. I just want to make sure that that's accurate. I, I, I don't recall that, but. Of Central AC. Yes. It, it could be one third of the cost based on the project, but that's not a standard rule. We can't, I can't tell you that that's the cost in all of them. It depends on the size and the scope of the project and what the, what the particular AC project will be in the design phase. So I, I don't know if that's a rule of thumb that we can say that definitively for all of them. So is there a difference between a renovation that is yeah. focused on air conditioning and a new construction of an entire new school? Absolutely. High school cost us approximately 90 to 110 million, and you're telling me one third of that cost is, is central air? I got that. Well, we're not telling you that. I, but I mean, is that accurate then? I can't believe it. In, in terms of installing air conditioning in existing buildings, we have costs that range from 500,000 <laughs> to 15 million dollars. I understand that. So uh, it depends on elementary, middle, or high, um, and I doubt that in cost of new construction, it's a lot easier to install the HVAC equipment as you build up and over. So I doubt that we would spend $30 million to air, uh, to air condition a new high school. Okay. 
but that's my okay. own supposition at well, this point. Mr. McDaniels. Um, yeah, one of our budget goals that I'm particularly interested in is um, the one to raise the bar and close gaps. And I submitted a question, and I got some answers. And I'm very kind of excited about um, our opportunity in this area. Um, and some of the, um, I guess, um, direction or investment of our seven or eight million dollars in this area, some of them are easier to quantify than others. So I would just like to make the comment that as a board, I'd like to work with um, Mrs. White, particularly on the academic part of this effort, to make sure we know where we are right now. And as we invest money, to try to get at some of these gaps. And some of our stakeholders talked about, um, in GT, for example, some of the uh, portions of our population that don't participate in some of our rigorous academic efforts. We're investing money so that we can see some movement in our um, in our uh, accomplishments over the course of the year or two as we try to close some of these gaps. Um, uh, some of the investment, I guess, is going to be harder to quantify, but I do hope that we can, can establish some benchmarks as we invest in closing gaps and we can kind of see how our efforts move over the course of the year. Very good. Mrs. Williams. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, first of all, let me just thank Dr. Dance and his staff for compiling um, our many questions that we submitted. Um, we have some 17 pages, and you really did a great job in answering our questions. I know more are to follow. Um, my question is, I understand that um, the nutri our nutrition programs are self-funding, um, and that revenue from federal and the state free and reduced price lunch program essentially pays for and supports the food and nutrition program at BCPS. My concern is what else can be done in terms of, in our budget, uh, to support um, those families who are homeless and just really dealing with poverty at just a horrible um, rate and it's ever increasing. And I, I'm, I am concerned about that. And I don't really see that enough in the budget. I know there's some reference to you know additional counselors. Mm -hmm. But what else is there and what else can be done? Um, from a food and nutrition standpoint, um, we um, always support and encourage families to make sure that we provide the necessary farms information that they can follow that process. That's one. For homeless um, families and students, there's a that there's a title program that helps support them as well. Uh, a lot of times, Ms. Williams, what that particular situation is, um, sometimes the families don't necessarily readily want to come forward, and we try to do everything we can at the school level to include um, supporting them with. Um, backpacks that go home overnight over the weekend to provide meals and things of that nature uh, summer feeding programs throughout the year um, certainly our efforts are not over we, ha we have a lot of work to do but it's a it's a concerted effort with the community social services the families and the schools to provide those supports as we move along and we constantly try to refine that each year but um, we, we definitely understand your concern so there was a suggestion from one of our speakers who also submitted information in writing to us about um, having a coordinator to sort of uh, you know identify the various federal and state programs that address um, the homeless and, and persons who are really dealing with um, poverty issues. How does that, how do you see something like that fitting into our operating budget? Thank you, Ms. Williams. Uh, we do have um, administrators that are designated for that uh, sole purpose. So, for instance, we do have a director of Title I programs who oversees uh, that type of um, um, funding for schools and particularly for, uh, for children and for families who are living in poverty, overseeing the educational program, overseeing also the uh, resources that are needed. In addition, we have a Department of Student Support Services uh, where we have 
uh, homeless homeless liaison. We have uh, liaisons for uh, that can work between uh, families and those social uh, agencies so that families can access uh, the, the required resources that they need. And in your um, opinion, do you believe our current operating budget um, is sufficiently meeting the needs of those offices and those programs? I do. I believe that we do have the administrators necessary to oversee those programs. Thank you. And those questions that you referred to that we received will be um, presented at the next work session along with any other um, constituent questions that we receive. Thank you very much. This might be an appropriate time to add to Mr. Saris's comment, which is um, additional questions uh, can be submitted in writing uh, and uh, the administration will deliver answers to us before our second work session, which is obviously uh, next Tuesday. Ms. Johnson. Thank you. Um, I have uh, just a, f a few general questions. What is the difference between a counselor and a social worker? Thank you. So our counselors um, do a, a lot in terms of working directly with our students with college and career readiness, making sure that they have, making sure they have appropriate schedules, um, making sure that they have a six-year graduation plan. Um, working, they do work with um, social emotional supports with our students as well. Our social workers work with students and their families to access the resources that they need in terms of making sure that they have uh, living arrangements that are appropriate, uh, accessing food and clothing um, for, for their families as well, and then also working with other agencies to make sure that if they need to access um, uh, housing kinds of um, uh, resources that they can do that as well. Great, thank you. So I see that we are um, increasing, or I'm assuming this is an increase for, for instance, elementary school, one counselor per school, um, and then if there's a projected enrollment over 700 students receiving two counselors. Is this an increase to what we have right now as far as counselors per school go? That's our, we're maintaining that ratio. Okay. Yes. And then are, is there an increase in the number of social workers? We are not. We increased social workers, I believe, a year ago, two Last years year. ago? Yeah, two years. Uh, where we have a social worker in every one of our high schools now. Okay. And so I would like to see uh, possibly in the future some of the Title I schools having additional social work workers um, to help with those, those need-based services. I also have additional questions on our English language, so our, our Spanish teachers, really. I see that we have six full-time employees um, for the passport expansion. This might be a question for Dr. Mayo. Will this make it even more difficult to find some of the Spanish teachers that we need if we're at, um, limiting the, the already limited pool of teachers that we have? Um, this, this past year, we hired over 70 Spanish teachers. Um, the concern, as everyone knows, has been the retention piece, uh, which is what we're working on with CNI and other departments. Um, so it's, it should not be an issue for us. Um, so we will definitely get the pool um, readily available for principals to actually select candidates from the pools. Uh, we have over 73 um, just college fairs and other recruitment events that we have going on this upcoming, this school year for our recruiting measures. And we also have several um, events going on during the school year as well here locally, just as a Spanish recruiting event as well. So we are definitely ready. Okay, and are we recruiting outside of Maryland? <coughs> yes. Okay. Yes. Good, good. Uh, and just lastly, I just wanted to, I guess, commend the Office of Transportation, not at this current moment, because we're still hearing a lot of complaints, but the, the, the future, the plan reorganization um, was really exciting to read kind of laid out like this. The safety and training, the focus customer service unit, which is, much, is very much needed, recruitment and retention, special education and maintenance. In the recruitment and retention, um, do we anticipate any increase in salary and, salary and or benefits for our drivers? That answer is yes. Um, if there's something part of this particular budget proposal here, as well as already in the bargaining unit for FY19 as well. The, the plan that we have for transportation, um, it is a comprehensive plan, it is a multi-year plan, and we have to make sure as we roll it out, we have the capacity to, to grow it and manage it as we move along, so. Great, great, thank so you So all much. bus drivers, uh, 
The entry level bus drivers received uh, an increase on July 1, just a reclassification of their positions, plus a COLA, plus a STEP. So, uh, and those COLAs and STEPs continue for FY18 and FY19 under the current labor agreement. And that was uh, about $700,000 in the FY17 budget to fund that reclassification. Great, thank you. Mr. Birch. Thank you, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, gentlemen, um, I want to uh, just, just observe just generally that there are a lot of really good things in this document. And the questions that are being asked by board members are because board members care about the good things and for more good things for our schools going forward. And the conversation isn't always about the past of where we've been, but of course where we want to go. Um, the other thing I'd like to say is that y'all um, uh, were not afraid to sort of show the performance measures and how you're doing, how we're doing with them. And I'll have more to ask about that, but because other members want to ask some questions, I want to get some good ones and quick ones in. I noted that uh, I had asked in my questions about a couple of um, uh, magnet programs in the sixth, in our sixth district. And one of those I asked about was Stemmer's Run. I had been to Stemmer's Run and parents who had come to a uh, uh, meeting at the school had said, you know, there needs to be reasons for kids to want to come to our Stemmer's Run. And I say our because I went to the place. Um, and I, I talked with the superintendent about it and I think there were other folks who had been communicating with the staff. And I note that in this budget, there is some significant funding for the magnet program for IB for Stemmer's Run. As I say, there's some very good things in this. I also note that what I also asked about Golden Ring Middle School. And while I note there is nothing, there is not a magnet funding means in this budget, there is the offer, the allure, the promise for next year. And I take the central office, the superintendent, at his word that that will be there. And for that, I think uh, um, we're moving in the right direction in that regard. I also wanted to ask you about um, another matter, and that's about transportation. I had asked this question because I was trying to figure out how we can quantify transportation expansion. And, you know, uh, you can talk about buses, but then you get into the issue of, like, how big are the buses? And the more... The more smaller buses you have, the more drivers that you need. Okay. And as I read the response that, that uh, y'all uh, studiously prepared, um, because I got my answers in on time at the before the close of business on Friday, y'all were able to do some research and answer. And so what I wanted to ask you is, uh, the 12 additional routes that are contemplated to be provided for $1.14 million <laughs> Uh, using contractors. How many more seats does that represent? Or does that mean like buses who, that, that are the biggest or they're the smaller ones? Because I want to follow up and ask you if you have a sense at the present time whether these 12 additional routes are special education routes, whether they are, uh, are uh, non-special education routes. And I only have this information because of the excellent job that Mr. McCray did at our Perry Hall Middle, or at our Perry Hall High School uh, just this week when Julie Hen and I were there. Uh, and there's a presentation to parents about transportation. So can you give us a sense, are we gonna have more seats for kids in these 12 additional routes? Uh, Mr. Virch, I think you did a wonderful intro for me to welcome <laughs> David McCray. <laughs> Our transportation director. Good evening, everyone. Um, to, in our bus purchases last year, Dr. Dance asked us to, uh, to look towards some buses with greater capacity. Um, with the... Uh, our demographics, our, our, our geographics, uh, sometimes that's not necessarily applicable for all our areas, but we did purchase uh, some and we are doing that again this year. So um, we did have some extended size buses uh, which have gone into our northwest area, which again is one of our areas um, where we've, we've needed them and obviously we need to keep one of those for training. We're purchasing another four this year uh, to look at where we can you know, utilize greater uh, numbers of seats um, to be able to to do that, and, and in, in the own area where we we were that last night, we know that capacity is an issue, and we will be, you know, looking to to use them in the northeast this year when they come online too. 
I got you. So that would be not just contracted bus right. services, but also additional buses that we will take ownership of, like Title II. We, we are purchasing them, that's correct, yes. Correct. Yeah. Excellent. Because I, when I saw the response, mm -hmm. um, I, and my recollection is, it was limited to just additional contracting. Mm -hmm. They're, they're in our bus purchases um, as well. So um, the additional contracted routes that you saw were due to, um, we had to put in additional routes for, for example, some of the Victory Villa mm -hmm. uh, accommodation as well. In our sixth district, yeah, yeah. That's right. Yeah. And we did also, um, we expanded some of our special needs routes to, again, we were, we're looking to address some of our journey times and so on, which we've started to do in working with Dr. Bluth and our team at S MSDE. And when Mr. McRae is referring to Victory Villa, what he means is we've picked up the entire student population and all the staff, and they're going from the Victory Villa uh, location over to the new, formerly, uh, Rosedale uh, Alternative School. Correct. And so we're now transporting a lot more people in buses, and we're transporting them back and forth. So that's why he's referring to this this what is a temporary right. measure yeah. uh, till the two-year construction uh, time frame right. is, is done with the school. And that was that was connected to the addition of those contracted routes because we were taking what was essentially quite a large walking school, making it into a completely bust school. Excellent. Thank you very much. Mr. Chairman, just have one more area of questioning uh, in this round. Um, with regard to the performance measures, directing your attention, gentlemen, to page 103, and there are a number of performance measures there. And again, I appreciate you just put it out as to what the information is, and it speaks for itself. And we have a population that's changing, and uh, the first one is the percentage of students demonstrating readiness for kindergarten. Well, until children come to us, it's difficult for us to be there doing things with them. Not that there isn't like the Judy program that will come to our Hawthorne Elementary School or similar programs in other locations in our county, but this creates special, unique challenges for us. And while we make up a lot of ground quickly, they, you know, that particular uh, measure gives us like a baseline. But as we go and look at some of these other performance measures, some of these are trending downward. And what I wanted to find out is I know we have a budget that packs a lot into it to do a lot of very good things. I acknowledge that. What I want to find out, and it's a very difficult question for me to ask budget folks, what sort of time frame might we expect to see these trend lines begin to trend in a different direction? And no, I note some of them have. But there are other performance measures here that have not. This is perhaps one of the most difficult questions you'll have to answer during the entire budget process. So what, if any, time frame, and should you defer to the superintendent, that's okay too. What sort of time frame should we expect to see these trend lines change? I'm going to defer to Russ Brown first, who's our, uh, from the Department of Research and Accountability. So as you will recall, last year, we supplied the board a memo uh, in May and actually went before curriculum committee and talked about our map assessment results. Uh, I'd like to remind the board that during um, the past several years, the only consistent measure that we've had, the only way we could benchmark our growth and our academic achievement in a consistent fashion over time uh, and compare ourselves to our national uh, peers around the country was the map assessment. With that assessment, uh, if, if you all recall, in grades one through eight in both reading and math, our students actually grew more than their peers around the country. They exceeded growth expectations uh, in reading and math across all grades. So I would suggest that the trends are in the right direction already. Um, in addition, if you review that memo, and I, I agree it was a while ago, but if you look carefully at that memo, you will see not only did we exceed the growth in reading and math in grades one through eight, <clears throat> but we also, our students changed their relative position to their peers in terms of percentile rank across those <coughs> grades as well in both reading and math. Um, and I think I gave an example in the write-up, whereas, you know, and I really appreciate you pointing out that each year our kids are coming to kindergarten less and less ready, which puts an ever more growing b uh, burden on our system to close gaps and close gaps quickly. So our students came into kindergarten in the 2012-13 year at about 42 percent 
prepared um, to, to enter school. By the start of third grade last year, they had caught up with their national peers, that their, their scores matched the national average. And by the midpoint of that year, they had exceeded it. And it actually exceeded the academic performance of all the prior cohorts that we'd used MAP with. So I think there's a lot of evidence that we're moving in the right direction with that. In addition, as you're all aware today, our graduation rate went up yet again uh, for the system. And we are closing gaps uh, between our ethnic groups as we move forward. So I think there's a lot of evidence that we're actually moving in the right direction. There are some challenges with other assessments in terms of making comparisons. So with the change in the format for the SAT, we've got a baseline. And that makes it hard. You can't compare prior years. But as we move forward, we have a baseline that we can work from. Um, and with PARC, obviously, there have been some flaws with that assessment. We've talked about those extensively in terms of uh, the mode of the, uh, by which a student takes that test uh, really matters for the interpretation of the result. The really only the constant measure that we've had over time has been MAP. And we're happy to provide those results to you over time. I'm happy to, to get another copy of that memo to you again. Great. Mr. Chairman, one last question. Uh, yeah, I would just repeat this. This is the last one. I just, I just would just. My question was oriented to a time frame. And I believe I answered it. No, I mean, and, I mean to, and I, I'm not going to be sarcastic. Tomorrow, next year, a five year, what is the time frame? So again, if you were to look at the map results from last year, the direction of the growth actually exceeds the growth across the country. The an average annual growth by grade by subject, that to me suggests that the trend is already going in the right direction. It's already happened. So then, and I know I said it was the last question, when I look at and my <laughs> colleagues look at the budget document next year, then we would not be surprised then to see these trend lines, these measures, the trend lines of these measures heading upward with the exception, of course, a percentage of students demonstrating readiness for kindergarten. That would be the expectation. All right, thank you so Very much. Good. Are there others who haven't yet had a chance to ask questions that want to ask questions? Mrs. Causey. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I have many questions, but in respect of time, I will try and prioritize them and make them to go quickly. Great. I did want to follow up uh, with Board Member Miller's question at the beginning of the meeting about the the um, adding an item to the to the records of this meeting, which I thought meant the facilities update we're supposed to get uh, HVAC document is is that document going to be given to us the board members at this meeting? It'll be given to you after this meeting. After a piece of paper after this meeting as we exactly. Leave. Okay, thank you. So that will not be available to the public through board docs? It, it'll go online this week, as Dr. Dance just said. It'll go online this week. Okay, thank you very much. Um, the other issue, um, and I'll just jump right to here, um, why is PARC not on the uh, performance measures list? Uh, well, I guess, uh, well, all the park scores are listed. Is that what you mean, Ms. Clausey? Every school's uh, park scores for the last two years are uh, noted. The percent passing. I, I'm looking at performance measures schools on page 103. And the, I was just mentioning in the school section, we do list by school how their uh, park results what okay. their park results are, if that's what you were asking. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, someone, a stakeholder asked specifically about that. So what page number does that begin on? Let me find that. I believe it begins on page uh, 124. Mm -hmm. Yes. The first uh, set of park exams are on 125. Okay. And is it fair to say this year, which is the second year of the park test results, um, that the majority of the Baltimore County results were lower than the state average? Yeah, I can't Russ answer that. Russ is going to answer that. 
No, that, that would not be an accurate generalization. So in what, in what categories were Baltimore County park results higher than the state average? So again, and actually you and I had spoken about this at one point, one of the frustrations with PARC is that the results for students who take the test on paper don't mean the same as the tests uh, that are taken online. And that has been a challenge for interpreting changes in scores over time. So without going back through and looking at an apples to apples comparison, uh, it makes it hard to talk about changes from time to time. For our system, students who went from paper to online actually did better than what was expected over time compared to their peers. So that goes back to uh, comments that were made, I want to say, over a year ago, possibly even up to two years ago, uh, from Senator Collins, former member of the board, related to the system moving forward with the STAT initiative in such a way that comparisons could not be made in terms of evaluating how effective the, t the uh, student's academic achievement is. Because if so many things are changing at the same time and nothing is held constant, then we are in the position we are in now where we don't know why the test scores are going up and going down. And I will be referring back to in next week um, asking again about the park test scores because the memo that the superintendent presented to us, which was not discussed at the board, the board has not discussed the park test as a whole, which I think is a mistake, um, and I've asked for that discussion to happen, and it has not, uh, where there are a number of key factors where Baltimore County test results are lower than the state average for the second year of the park testing. And there was the first year discussion that it was a baseline, but one would expect things to go up, and they did not. Um, and I'll bring that memo next week. Um, so that just takes me back to the point of we have made many, many changes in the school system, and it makes it difficult to attribute the success or the lack of success to a particular uh, factor. Uh, one of the things that could be done with the Lighthouse schools, um, and this was suggested a year ago, is that since those students were taking the park tests online, the majority, the first year, then you could bring back to the board an evaluation of how their testing went on the second year. So that's something that still, in my uh, opinion, needs to be considered. So thank you for that, and now I'll jump to something else. So two points. Um, one, that I'd, I'd like to come back to something I mentioned with Mr. Birch, which is the only co consistent assessment that we've had during this window of time that has had a, a stable scale which allows us to make comparisons across the country is MAP. On the MAP assessment, our students grew more than their peers around the country, across the system, in reading and math across grades one through eight. Um, we will, this year, as part of the STAT initiative and part of the evaluation of STAT, incorporate student learning as planned. That will be part of what is measured uh, this year in the report, end of your report for STAT. Um, those things will be addressed. But if I, you know, coming back to, to this interpretation, we have a measure that we have used over time and it is showing that our students are growing and growing at a rate that exceeds their peers and that they have changed their, their relative position to their peers around the country. We can produce that memo for you again if you would like. That would be great. And I would just reference back to page 103, which my fellow board member Steve Virch was referencing also, where Cork. percentage grade three students demonstrating on grade level reading went down from fiscal year 15 to fiscal year 16. Percentage of students completing algebra with a grade of B or higher by the end of grade eight also went down from last year to this year. The SAT score, as you mentioned, is completely different, so we're unable to um, we're unable to compare the fiscal year 15 with the fiscal year 16 scale. Um, however, we were on a downward trend from fiscal year 13, 14, and 15 on the SAT previously. Um, so, and then there's. Um, Okay, we have the graduation rate, which, which is great. That was pending and that came out today, so thank you for that. All right, thank you very much. That, um, 
The other question I had related to, and I would also like to thank the staff for getting these answers um, back to us in this format. I know that I submitted a lot of questions. I also asked for stakeholders' um, comments and questions to be addressed, and there's more of that that we'll be getting um, hopefully later this week so that we, the board members can look at it over the weekend. Um, the next thing that I wanted to address was one of the answers to the questions um, had to do with, um, on page 11 of this response, investing in the future, um, talking about a reduction in capital projects offsetting the increase, the increased employee compensation and benefits. And the answer was no. Um, and the statement is the capital budget is funded independently of the operating budget. And I would just like to ask the question of um, Mr. Smith or Dr. Dance about the um, press release on May 18th from the uh, Baltimore County Executive's Office wherein it stated that the, um, they were advancing funds for central air conditioning and uh, where it states that uh, Dr. Dance asked about utilizing $20 million of surplus funds to forward fund the installation of central air conditioning. So that, in fact, is taking money out of our operating budget and applying it to central air conditioning. Isn't that correct? So that's, that's not new information. That was information this board voted on last school year. Um, it's important to know, though, that while we carry the funds, and Witt and George, you can definitely answer this more articulately than I can, while we carry general funds on our balance sheet, we end our year every year with a zero budget. So if we want to use any of our general fund dollars, we have to go back to the county administration, get approval, and then ultimately the county council has to approve that allotment. But to forward funding to get our students in air conditioned spaces, which is what this, this board asked me to do, I did ask you all for permission, ultimately the county executive, to use 20 million of fund balance. I just thank you for that explanation. And what I did just want to point out uh, to the board members and to the community and um, to you, superintendent, and the staff is that every decision we make is important. And to say that this is operating and that is capital, yes, they have legal separations, they follow different processes, but they do impact each other. And this is just one $20 million example of how that can happen. Mr. Cosby, may I respond to that for one minute on the 20 in, million? In that, and the reason why I said that is this, okay. is, that is not something that I would have traditionally recommended. The board definitely wanted it as a priority. Our community wanted it as a priority. And when the county said that they wanted to step up and forward fund dollars and we could assist, then I absolutely agreed to bring that recommendation to the board. But traditionally, I would not recommend using any part of the operating budget for capital expenses. I, I understand that this was a unique circumstance, but it, it did happen. And I'm not saying that I disagree with it. So I'm not, I'm not suggesting that I disagree with that, and I'll, um, I have another uh, line of question, and then I'll make a comment about that. Um, so just so you know, Ms. Causey, um, it's been 10 or 12 minutes now, um, and I, I'm sure there are others around the table that want to speak, so please go keep, keep going, but um, uh, another minute or two. Okay, so my other question about that related to the um, $41 million projector um, contract that the board unanimously rejected last February uh, 2016. And was that the uh, one of the savings that allowed you to transfer $20 million from operating to the capital? No. And George, <coughs> George, you can answer further, but no. Yeah, no, that, um, the impact uh, on that would um, have had a uh, relatively modest impact on the, I want to say, $7 million um, in FY17, um, which uh, would not have affected our ability to make that $20 million capital contribution. Okay, and how does it tie into the negative $2.5 million that's on the um, STAT budget update? So the money that was in the budget for projectors was not spent, so it ended up reducing uh, the additional cost of the one-to-one -one devices that would have, that was scheduled to occur this year, or next year, excuse me. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I have 
additional questions, but if there's other board members that have not had an opportunity. Thank you, Ms. Causey. Are there others who have not yet asked questions that have a desire to ask questions? I don't see any. Um, Mrs. Miller, did you have more you wanted to continue with? Yes. Um, if, uh, if we were to modify STAT's device ratio to be in line with the Maryland Educational Technology Plan's recommendation for elementary schools of a three to one student to device ratio, uh, what would the cost savings be annually? Uh, can't answer that tonight, um, but we'll get back to you with that information. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll remind you again, that's a, that's a perfect example of a question. If you submit your questions in writing by a close of business on Thursday, that's this Thursday the 26th, then we'll get answers in writing before our next work session, which is Tuesday at 5.30. Okay, thank you. Um, also, the budget book on page 21 states that the mid-year evaluation of STAT will be given to the curriculum committee in February 2017. Is that still on schedule, and um, why will the report not also be given to the full committee where all board members can ask questions of the JHU staff? I think Dr. Brown or Dallas will. Yeah, and, and I know this is under academics. I, I believe we're still on schedule for it. It has been traditional practice that over the last two years, the board has gotten mid-year reports in curriculum committee. As those meetings are open to the public and the board has actually come to those meetings, I believe the chair sent, um, I think we sent on behalf of the chair today, that all committee meetings will be held in this room, so we will be able to archive uh, those, those meetings going forward. Um, and then the full year or the full school year report would then come to the full board at the conclusion of the year for STAT and for Passport. And I don't know if Ms. White, if you want to add anything. And Dr. Jans, I was just going to add that the full board does receive the report at the conclusion of the curriculum committee um, meeting. So uh, the board will have full access to that report. Uh, and as far as I understand, uh, Johns Hopkins is still on schedule uh, for the February meeting. I appreciate that. And I do want to thank um, our chairman and the superintendent for making that change, having the committee meetings live streamed. I think that'll be very helpful to the public. But again, when you attend a committee meeting, um, only committee members can actually participate and ask questions. So it would be very helpful. And I think um, the size of the STAT program warrants that that media report should be given to the full board where we can all equally participate. Uh, another topic, if I have time for another question. Um, last year, there was an analysis done on the actual contingency money, and I don't know, I might be, this might not be the right question uh, here, but. Um, contingency money spent on contracts, and it showed that the average was 6%, if I recall correctly. Um, currently, we set aside the standard 10%, but if only 6% are actually being used, um, I'm wondering, and this was one of the questions I submitted, how much in dollars would we save by lowering our contingency to, say, 8%, and where in the budget does unused contingency money go? It's a capital budget item, and we'll respond to that question uh, in advance of, for the next meeting. Okay, thank you. All right, Mrs. Causey, if you have additional questions. I do, thank you. The um, earlier um, this year, I want to say it was June, at a meeting, uh, the board approved uh, the superintendent's plan to um, have a community superintendent model for the schools. And it was indicated at that time that it would be fiscally neutral. Uh, then, it, then when the full organization chart came out, um, instead of the community superintendents uh, replacing the nine assistant superintendents, uh, we kept eight of the assistant superintendents, so in fact added a layer of um, 
three additional personnel to that model. So at the time it was described as fiscally neutral, but I would like to understand what is the exact uh, fiscal impact of that decision because if you add three higher level personnel, how can that be neutral? Well, I believe the statement was that it was FTE or headcount neutral rather than fiscally neutral. Although I may misunderstand that, but that's how I've always referenced it. And um, Mr. Tantliff will uh, go over some of the cost impacts. Um, so, um, so the the total impact. Uh, so it was FT neutral. The total uh, dollar impact, when all was said and done, um, was about six hundred thousand dollars per year for salaries. So ongoing. Correct. Yes. So it'll be ongoing. Now, does that include their pension and the other <coughs> costs that are associated with our employees? Um, I believe. Uh, I think I'm it was to double just based on yeah. usually when we cost these things out yeah. because everything ends up in that other charges account. We and because the same benefit plan applies to any yeah. position and it's relatively constant. Yeah, uh, we usually just work with salaries. If that includes any phone stipends, uh, contracts, overtime, anything like it was everything, uh, mostly salaries though. Okay, thank you very much. Um, can you uh, compare, as another other board member has pointed out, the raises percentage of our instructional teachers, the teachers in the classroom, uh, with the administrative, because the administrative costs have gone up at a greater percentage rate. So compare the, the salary raises, please. Uh, the, the percentages were identical. Basically, the administrative staff uh, is ends up being tied to the um, contractual negotiated um, increases. Whether there's a step available, the COLAs are identical across the system. The COLAs are identical across the system. All so, bargaining units got 2% in the most recent contracts. So then any increase in that administrative budget is because there's either additional FTEs being added and or contracted services, or how is that extra percentage of growth accounted for um, in the uh, administrative budget? Um, Ms. Ms. Miller asked, was asking about that earlier, and the majority of the increase in administrative costs are IT related. In particular, um, we have proposed the same as last year, but it got removed to put a new enterprise system and to upgrade our chrono system. Uh, there was software licensing, et cetera. That, was the, that is the majority of the increase in administration. Okay, thank you. Um, and then I wanted to, um, I wanted to talk um, about the, uh, on page 14 of, other questions, which is the uh, responses to board members' questions document that uh, will be available online. Thank you for uh, doing that, Dr. Dance. Um, the question is, why did BCPS fund STAT over competing priorities? Hundreds of millions spent on STAT so far, while funding for instruction is relatively flat. STAT crowding out poverty programs, driver pay increases, and critical capital projects to improve student environment. And then the answer from the administration is that STAT aligns with the BCPS Strategic Plan Blueprint 2.0, which was approved by the board. The initiative was evaluated by the board and funded along with other critical educational priorities. Bus drivers receive pay increases in addition to their regular COLAs and steps in fiscal year 2017 and through fiscal year 2019, and capital projects are funded outside of the operating budget so are not impacted by STAT except in this unique circumstance that we just talked about. And I guess what I wanted to do is to make it clear to the board members, my fellow board members, and also to the community, that Dr. Dance is clearly putting the responsibility of budget choices on this board, and particularly in this instance, on the support for Blueprint 2.0. I would like to point out 
to uh, board members that are new and to the community who may not recall, but Blueprint 2.0 has not been voted on by this board since July of 2015, when at that time I was a new member along with five others. Uh, since that time, we have two members who have not been on the board, and um, we have not had a, a complete evaluation of Blueprint 2.0 or a discussion of it with the board and with the community. So I think um, next week I'll be making a motion that um, we evaluate Blueprint 2.0 over the next six months, and then in July when we uh, typically handle our, have our board retreat, that we really evaluate what we want to stay in Blueprint 2.0 and how we might improve it. Um, I will be um, taking input from community members, fellow board members, um, staff, superintendent, um, about that process, uh, because I believe that we really need to make it a clear evaluation. I think we need to make it one that includes input with teachers, the parents, the community. I think we need to talk about the performance measures, what we need to see to understand the impact of these budget decisions on our student achievement, but also our student quality of life, our teachers' quality of work, and how we're uh, moving forward as a county school system. Ms. Causey, do you have any more questions of our uh, presenters about the budget? Uh, because if not, I think we've had a really good discussion for over an hour about the budget. We have another work session next week, and we have other items on our agenda. Thank you, Mr. Gillis. I do have other questions, but I will send them in writing to the superintendent to be answered by the staff. And again, my question would be, if there's anyone that wants to give input into uh, my suggestion that I'll be bringing up next week, please email me, kcausey at bcps.org, or uh, give me a call. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you all. That was, a, I think, a good and valuable discussion about the budget. I thank our presenters for, um, for doing such a fine job, both of giving us written responses uh, and of uh, uh, answering the questions that are presented today. I've reminded you twice, I'll remind you one more time that if you have written questions submitted by Thursday, uh, you'll have answers by next Tuesday and our work session next Tuesday is at 5.30. Uh, next on our agenda is public comment on policy 3150. And we have two speakers. The first is Bosch Ferrone. Doctor. Good evening again. PRC is one committee I truly enjoy. Thanks for the leadership of Ms. Williams and really the hard work of the three members. Um, so my questions are, and just in case if they were there in public forum whatsoever and I missed them, uh, I probably missed them because some of the board members speak softly. So I remind you for somebody like me who's ears are small a little bit, please speak into the microphone. Policy 3150, uh, the question I have in the implementation, item A, and it is the word adequate insurance program are in place to minimize the adverse impact of risks, etc. cetera. Uh, my question is the word adequate. What does adequate mean? Does it mean what I understand it means. Does it mean the same thing for every board members? Um, I don't really understand why keeping a word like this, which is very elastic in a policy. So for me as a independent, uh, nonpartisan public speaker, so to speak, when I look at it, you know, what's the value of that word with it being elastic? And the second thing that I have a question about policy 3150 is, again, from the uh, view of public, does that mean the school system have um, not just really fire uh, coverage for insurance, but also for vandalism or malicious acts, injuries, loss of paper, loss of computer, loss of art, uh, loss of equipment, or injury because of uh, working on computers so much and getting carpal tunnel syndrome or 
eye injury or back injury because of sitting so many hours behind computers? Um, does it also cover sexual harassment in the school system? Does it cover what happened in Lansdowne where security breach happened and students were beaten up by invaders from outside? Um, does it cover acts of uh, local terrorism and uh, terrorism from outside or act of war, etc.? So, um, you know, with all these things, as a public person, I look at the policy to kind of be more informative, and I really find it elastic in nature and very brief. Uh, last but not least, just a thought about uh, insurance policies. If the school system is good to the whole community, you probably don't need an insurance. You know, the community would be <laughs> supportive of all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Marion Moore. I'll finish where I left off. So, Dr. Dance, I'm sure you may have explored with a variety of the strategies that I mentioned earlier uh, while leading your team, but a marathon has a finish line and life doesn't, it goes on. So how is your leadership helping others to create a legacy that will continue for generations without feeling overworked, overpowered, overlooked, overwhelmed with, and defeated by the competitiveness of this political education game? When organizations are extremely competitive, they face many risks which leads to policy 3150, non-instructional services board uh, insurance program. I recall talk, uh, covering risk management in my finance class and um, the school system is, fa are, is faced with many risks every day from bullying to the use of technology or simply hiring and, and uh, the promoting process. And it can be an extreme cost on a school system. I want to focus on the potential risks that are faced with the four areas of Blueprint 2.0. I too agree with Ms. Causey in terms of revisiting 3.2.0, Blueprint 3. <laughs> Actually, it should be 4.0, right? And um, so we want to raise the bar there. Um, and let me just uh, talk about some of the goals and how and what risk. Uh, are faced within those goals. So I'm going to co combine uh, academics uh, goal one and I believe goal four, organizational effectiveness. Earlier we were talking about Spanish teachers uh, and the retention of Spanish teachers. Uh, however, there was a new initiative with the passport uh, program. So losing Spanish teachers, of course, is a is a risk, but when you're dealing with risk, you either you manage it, you try to avoid it, you may transfer it, or you will uh, assume it. In this case, why can you transfer the risk and uh, have like online teachers from a Spanish-speaking country to uh, collaborate with you all? In addition. Um, because of the one-to-one -one device, of course, premiums could go up high because of the damages of the, uh, the computers. Uh, because t t uh, the students are learning computer programming, there's going to be an increased risk of students hacking into the computers. It happened to me. <laughs> um, in terms of safety, the safety goal, we have the construction uh, department that's affected. So the community want to have a lot of renovations and buildings. So that's going to increase the risk because you're going to try to accommodate them. That's more cost. So I'll send you an email with the rest, okay? Thank you. All right, bye bye. <laughs> uh, next on our agenda is uh, item L in there. I'm sorry, item K. Um, comments from board members and we'll start with Ms. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I, before before you start, I, I, I ask all the board members to please be considerate of the time that's allocated for this and um, and be respectful of other board members. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Chair. First, I would like to congratulate the Eastern Tech Robotics team on an outstanding performance and first place finish at the Cardinal Classic VEX Robotics Competition on Saturday. Attending the competition was a welcome break from reviewing the FY18 proposed operating budget, which is how I spent the rest of the week. Um, speaking of which, I would next like to thank all BCPS staff who contributed to the proposed budget. I know the amount of work the board has spent in reviewing it. I can't begin to imagine the level of effort needed to actually produce it. 
I would specifically like to thank Dr. Dance for working with the board to date and over the next two weeks to respond to our many questions. The written responses are most appreciated. I look forward to receiving those in advance of our next work session. Lastly, I would like to thank Mr. David McCray and staff from the Office of Transportation for presenting an update on busing at the Northeast Area Education Advisory Council meeting last night. The meeting was well attended and led to good discussion. The community was very pleased to learn about planned improvements, including the implementation of automatic vehicle location software, as well as enhanced customer service. Improved communication between the Office of Transportation, schools, and families seems to be a shared goal, and I look forward to reports on the progress of these initiatives to that end. Thank you. Thank you. Mrs. Miller. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, also, I want to thank you for leading the board through a very good um, discussion on the budget. It's very important. Um, I'm continuing to ask for a purge of student social security numbers from our data records. There has been its support expressed not only by um, a number of my fellow board members, but by the public. The best way to protect student data is to purge unnecessary data. Although BCPS stopped collecting student social security numbers several years ago, that does not mean the ones already collected have been removed, and it is incumbent upon the system to purge this sensitive student information. Let's learn from the recent news of a student data breach that affected Frederick County Public Schools. Um, a Carnegie Mellon study indicates that minors are over 50 times more likely to be targeted for identity theft of social security numbers. So if BCPS will at least purge its own records for social security numbers, we can eliminate the possibility of our student SSNs being compromised in the future. Finally, I look forward to reviewing the report on the status of AC in our schools regarding partial AC, non-functioning AC, and I hope uh, also indoor classroom air temperatures. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Miller. Mr. McDaniels. Thank you, Mr. Gillis. Um, I would just like to publicly thank uh, Principal Thorne and his staff at uh, Catonsville Middle School uh, for including me in their tie ceremony on January 12th at their school. Um, it was a ceremony uh, that included their Boys to Men organization where they had over 30 young men in the school, uh, many of whom were causing distractions and problems in the school years ago, but now are part of an organization where they're actually uh, bringing positive results to Catonsville Middle School. Uh, it was a, a great example of collaboration between the staff at Catonsville and the community. They had um, uh, sponsors from the community who actually purchased the ties and shirts for the young men. Um, there were community members that participated. The PTA um, gave funds for their meetings in the evening, but it was a great example of teamwork and it was a very positive night, and uh, it was just very uplifting to be included in that program. Um, also, I just want to give a quick shout out to the parents at uh, Edmondson Heights Elementary School who invited me to a PTA meeting last week. They had great energy in the meeting. A lot of the discussion was about how to get more parents involved at Edmondson Heights. But they also wanted to let me know what a great job they thought their principal, uh, Ms. Principal McDevitt, was doing us in her years at um, Edmondson Heights. So it was a real positive meeting and um, we look forward with working with them to get more of the parents involved at that particular school. Thanks. Thank you. Mr. Birch. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank uh, the, uh, the staff and, of course, uh, Dr. Brown for his uh, uh, optimistic uh, prediction with regard to uh, uh, at least one of our performance indicators. Uh, we hope that they all go up. Uh, it's our job as board members to monitor these as, as our parents do because it's a way for them to take a look at, at the schools where their children are attending. Um, I also had the opportunity uh, just uh, uh, Saturday to go to the uh, uh, Chinese New Year, the Lunar New Year event over at Delaney High School. It was a fantastic event. If any of our uh, other board members who scheduled didn't permit them to attend have the opportunity next year to go, it really is uh, a, a fun event to go to, and it's good to learn about a culture that, as you heard tonight, is 5,000 years old and is now part of our American uh, uh, tapestry. I would also note, um, in passing, that last week a, uh, an educator um, from the Baltimore County Public School System uh, who had retired had passed. 
Uh, his name was George Hole. He had uh, uh, come to uh, Maryland from Pennsylvania. His father had been a mathematics professor. Uh, his father came to work at the Glen O. Martin Company in Arrow Middle River, where he, uh, where he decrypted German rocketry codes. Uh, George uh, becomes a graduate of Kenwood High School, the Kenwood High School that stands on Philadelphia Road, and we know it as our Golden Ring Middle School. Uh, George uh, later taught at Villa Cresta, goes into the service, comes out, goes back to Villa Cresta, becomes an assistant principal uh, at our Battle Grove Elementary School, a principal at Red House Run in Pine Grove, uh, ultimately becoming a principal uh, at uh, Deer Park. Uh, he's also a, uh, like a science supervisor for, for teaching. And he retires in 1999. He goes to work for the Department of uh, Education for the state to mentor new teachers in Baltimore City. But that's not enough. He then comes back to Baltimore County for another 15 years uh, to act as an acting principal when there are, are principals on long-term leave. He had been called a principal's principal. And his passing uh, marks the passing of an era, a dedication of a life and a career to education and the improvement of the quality of life in our county. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Hirsch. Ms. Brett. Hi, everyone. I just want to update people on student member of the board applications. They're going to be due February 11th. We had an interest meeting on January 19th last week. Um, for those who missed it or who think they might know a student who's interested, um, you can look at it. It's being live, er, it was live streamed and is now available on the BCPS webpage. So that's all from me. Thanks. Thank you. Mrs. Johnson. Thank you. Thank, I want to um, first thank Abby Baton and Tabco for hosting the Every Student Succeeds Act Forum at Lock Raven High School. It was very informative. And um, I look forward to working with staff and the superintendent on, on helping or figuring out what kind of plan you're going to have moving forward. Uh, some things that I would love to see um, written in the plan are, are reduced class sizes, um, additional support for each of our student, additional support staff for, for our schools, autonomy for teachers. I feel like the teachers that I've spoken to want some autonomy. They want to be able to do adequate testing, but not over testing. And um, measured enrollment in our advanced academic classes and courses for our children of color, our ELL students, and our um, farm students. So again, thank you, Abby, for hosting that. I also want to thank Delaney High School and the Chinese School of Baltimore for the event on Saturday. Um, I was there with Mr. Virch and Mr. McDaniels, and it was a it was a um, fascinating. They actually had um, a huge buffet of, of different food, different Chinese food, and and students dressed up, and adults dressed up doing dancing and and different traditional um, performances for us. So thank you for for hosting that. Thank you. Thanks. Mr. Yulfelder. Yes, thank you. Um, a couple of items. First of all, it was mentioned before that the uh, graduation rate uh, for uh, BCPS <coughs> increased again for the sixth year, and I just want to make sure it gets into the record. That's a great accomplishment. Um, I also want to uh, congratulate <coughs> Dr. Dance on receiving uh, one of five national awards presented by the National Coalition for Technology and Education and Training. Um, the other four um, recipients, in addition to Dr. Ward, were uh, uh, Judge Sandra Day O'Connor, uh, Honorable Jessica Rosewell, former commissioner of FCC, and the executive director of Project Lead the Way. And uh, I'm really, um, and I've always said this, I really feel great about working with Dr. Dance. He, he's truly uh, a flag bearer for our educational system, recognized nationally. Uh, the last thing, in, in response to what Ms. Miller said relative to Social Security numbers, the, uh, as a result of her comments several weeks ago, the Internal Audit Committee uh, the, uh, at our last meeting um, decided by unanimously that the Internal Audit Division of the school system will undertake a comprehensive review of all student data records relative uh, to uh, retention, disposal, privacy, security, et cetera, which will also include uh, social security numbers. Uh, we have to remember that uh, many of our records are electronic, and we have many records in the school system that are still paper and folders. So this will be a comprehensive examination, 
in accordance to whatever the laws are. There may be many federal and state laws uh, out there. Maybe we are complying with all of them, maybe not some of them, but in, in any event, internal audit will undergo investigation. And in those cases where we are not in compliance, we will make sure that we are in compliance. So I just wanted to announce that. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Causey. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I also wanted to thank Dr. Sun of the Chinese Baltimore School and Dr. Uh, Shula Jha for their kind invitation to the Lunar New Year. I was able to attend that uh, at Delaney High School with the other board members also, and it really was a wonderful evening. So I am wishing everyone a happy Lunar New Year. Uh, I also uh, liked what uh, Dr. Jha said in her comments about unity and inclusion starts with our neighbors, and I really thought that was significant, especially in a time when there is a lot of controversy in our country, that we really take the time to reach out one-to-one -one and acknowledge each other, acknowledge that although we may have different opinions or different backgrounds or different cultures, um, that we truly can appreciate the differences and respectfully express any uh, disagreements that we have or just different opinions, not even uh, disagreements. Uh, next, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Bosch Faron for his very kind words. Uh, he has been an inspiration in terms of his determination to come to the Board of Education and to try and improve the educational system for the students and the families, and I appreciate his support. I would also like to thank the superintendent and staff for the work on the budget. Uh, as fellow board member uh, Hen says, it's an incredible amount of work to put that together, and we do appreciate it. And unfortunately, I will be sending in additional questions um, <laughs> for you to work on this week, uh, especially there were some of the questions related to stakeholder input uh, that I did want to address, and also uh, the advisory councils. There were several that had put forward specific uh, budget requests, and I wanted to see how those specifically were responded to. Um, also, um, under the issue of raising the bar, which is very important, and I'm so glad to hear about the results from the latest graduation rates and how we are eliminating um, any gaps that we have there. Um, I do just go back to the grading and reporting uh, procedures that still are uh, causing problems with our families and uh, would really like to see that brought up um, more to the full board so that we can make sure that we're doing all that we can to help our students and our families and the teachers with that. Um, also, I'd like to thank Mr. Um, Gillis for live streaming the committee meetings. That's going to be very helpful. And after the budget process is over, I'll be asking if we can evaluate building and contracts committee meeting being held on a different day to increase efficiency uh, of the board meetings. Um, also, in some of the budget questions that I'll be sending, uh, the teacher-student ratio, also smaller class sizes. Um, also, I'll be working uh, with evaluating stakeholder requests, including staffing to support our neediest students, as we heard from Dr. Uh, Lori Taylor Mitchell uh, last week and has been talked about by other board members. Um, I also wanted to say that I have received the uh, letter regarding Delaney High School that was sent to us uh, by the uh, members of the Maryland General Assembly who represent this area. And I do want to say that I agree uh, that there needs to be a discussion about replacing rather than renovating Delaney High School. And I uh, look forward to having a meeting about that with board members and uh, the members of the Maryland General Assembly. Um, and I do want to say that I will really be working on putting forward a motion to evaluate Blueprint 2.0. It's been in use for over three years, um, and it is time to understand how it is impacting our uh, teachers, our students, and our families and our communities. Uh, also, to find out where the allocations of money are specifically helping and programs that we may want to expand. We talked about some of those in the Building and Contracts Committee today with contracts that we passed today. Um, and it is very important for the board members to understand that every budget decision does rest on the votes that we make. Um, and there'll be um, an opportunity also to uh, improve Blueprint 2.0, and we can call it Blueprint 3.0 in this um, software-driven environment, that's certainly a reasonable thing. Um, I really want to add uh, about facilities as a very specific goal measure, um, because that clearly, clearly is a very important um, issue in our school system. 
Um, it's also time in this three-year mark uh, to evaluate the impact of the high school schedule change that was announced by Dr. Dance in the fall of 2013 and then implemented uh, in January of 2014 when the uh, scheduling took place for the students in, in the high schools. Um, one of the impacts that I can tell you about comes from the consultant company that was hired to uh, make recommendations around scheduling, and one of those <coughs> impacts um, was the reduction so that in full-time employees, which in this instance means teachers, um, that could save the district $3,540,000 annually. Now that number is low because the uh, consulting company used the salary of $30,000 in its calculations, but our starting salary in Baltimore County Public Schools is $46,000. So if you consider that some of the teachers um, may be more experienced in that and averaged it at $50,000 per, that's a si significant number, which I believe is reflected in the stat um, spreadsheet as a budget alignment. Um, so I'll be putting that question out to, to staff to answer in its written answers. Uh, but the other impact of the high school schedule change was for De Delaney High School and other seven period day schools um, where the teacher workload increased because they were then switched from teaching five classes to six classes per year. So their teacher workload increased. While there was a slight decrease in some class sizes of about two students, the teacher workload increased uh, by much, much more than that. It also re uh, resulted in decreased instruction time for those students that were used to only taking seven classes per year and then had to fit eight classes in the same number of minutes per day. So that's another thing that I'll be putting um, in the motion in terms of um, evaluating where the system has been and what we can do to improve where we're headed. Thank you. Ms. Williams. Thank you. I just want to remind everyone that PRSC's next meeting is February 13th. Ms. Eaton. I don't have any good stories to say, so I'm just going to say good night. Mr. Stewart. Loved it. <laughs> Um, I just want to share a few thoughts to the Lansdowne High community and to say that uh, we do recognize that this incident is very concerning and I don't think it's just a bullying incident. It is one that involved kids who came in who are not part of the Lansdowne High community into the school affecting an assault. And um, we have been assured that appropriate steps have been taken to address the situation, but I think our community should know what exactly happened and how it can pre be prevented moving forward because it is just a little bit more serious than a bullying incident. Um, so I'd encourage the administration to engage in that dialogue with the community to try to address those issues. Um, keeping our kids safe is about as basic as it gets. So I understand why there's such an outpouring. I understand why it's made headlines. Um, and more importantly, I understand why we need to take this seriously. Thanks. Thank you all for those comments. Um, I'm like a broken record. January 31st at 5.30 is our next work session. And then, of course, February 7 at 6.30 is our next board meeting. Uh, we're adjourned.